So I hope you all have had a great week and you're having a great day in the Lord today. We're going to dig back into our study of Hebrews 3. So as we typically do each week, we'd like to flip back and do a quick review. So last week we studied Hebrews 3 verses 1 through 6 where Jesus was, de was compared to and declared superior to Moses. So open up your Bibles to Hebrews 3 and take a look at verse 1. So as you look at that verse, what were the readers called? Holy brothers. Holy brothers. And what else? Okay, partakers or sharers of the heavenly calling. All right, so as holy brothers, holy brethren, we are all part of God's family, the family of God. The fact that they are holy, we talked about, means that they were consecrated, they were set apart specifically for God's use. And they were made holy because Jesus is our great high priest and paid our sin debt. By being partakers of a heavenly calling, we're partakers when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We receive a hope. We receive a future. The future being eternal life with Jesus in heaven, right? And we are called in verse 1 to do what? With Jesus. Consider or to meditate upon Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he's made for us. And he is called the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Apostle, remember, meant sent one. And he was sent by God himself with a message of salvation and to be the vehicle of salvation. And he was the high priest of our confession. He offered himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sin debt. So that's, that's the remembrance. That's the thing we're supposed to focus upon. And it's that sacrifice that is the focus of our confession. That's what that verse was talking about, remember? All right, so now jump into verse 2. Both Moses and Jesus were called faithful to their calling, but there's a big difference between the two, and we see it in verse 3 through 6. So Moses was faithful as what? Okay, he was faithful in all of God's house, and there's a specific role he played in verse 5. It begins with an S. He was a servant. That's right. But Jesus was above that, because in verse 6, he was called faithful as a, a son. All right? That's significant. A servant has no part in the inheritance that the father would give. But as a son, he had the authority to act for the Father because he is an heir. He is an heir to the inheritance. That puts him over the house. The church is what that's referring to, the body of believers. And we are called at the end of verse 6 to do what? Called to do two things. Hold fast our confidence. And what's the second thing? Rejoice or boast in the hope, firm until the end. So we're to hold fast to our confidence and boast in our hope. We're to be confident in our faith. And we're to boast or proclaim the gospel. That's the admonition in verse 6. All right, that was a good review, folks. You did a good job. So now we're going to jump into Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11, and we're going to park there this week. So could I get somebody, please, to read Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11? So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me, and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. 
So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Thanks, Dwight. So as we begin with verse 7, we see therefore again. And we're not going to say whenever you see therefore, you have to look at what it's there for. I promise I'm not going to say that again. But it refers back. It refers back specifically to the admonition at the end of verse 6 to hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope until the end. In essence, this verse is saying, as a result of this, just as the Holy Spirit says. So we want to park on that for a second. That little phrase tells us two specific things. What are they? He's speaking. He's speaking. It's exactly right. And who is speaking? The Holy Spirit. All right, so this is really significant. We need to grasp this, okay? The message in Scripture comes from and is revealed by the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's any secret to any of us who've been coming to church a long time or who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. When we study the Scripture, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the truth in, in, the, in the Bible. The second thing, the fact that it says that the Holy Spirit says, means it's a continual message that the Holy Spirit speaks. It's not spoken once. It's spoken continually. God spoke to the writers of each of the books in the Bible through His Holy Spirit. Moreover, it's the Holy Spirit who allows us to and helps us to understand Scripture. If you've ever picked up the Bible before praying for the revelation of the Holy Spirit, you know you're just reading a bunch of words. And sometimes you look at it and say, what? Makes no sense. Especially if you're digging deep into something Paul is saying. I mean, we were looking at, at 2 Corinthians this morning in our life group. And it talks about being a comfort. But if you look at the verses, it mentioned comfort, what was it, Diane, Stephen, six or seven different times in two verses. It sounded like Paul was talking in a giant circle. He wasn't. Every one of those comforts had a specific meaning and a reason for being. And the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals each one of those. So that's really important for us. He allows us to understand Scripture. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21 says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own, one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Secondly, the fact that the author of Hebrews wrote, just as the Holy Spirit says, indicates that the Holy Spirit continually speaks and is speaking. The verb here in Greek, lege, means he is speaking. So we're going to stop there for a second, and I want to share a quick illustration. So when I was a kid, when I was a kid, my mom used to make artichokes. Okay. In fact, she made artichokes all the way when I was growing up, and Diane still makes artichokes. I love artichokes. And we'd get this artichoke, and we'd put it into a large pot with a little bit of water, and with some olive oil, and some garlic, and there was breading stuffed in between the leaves of the artichoke. And we'd sit there, and, and I would eat it. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you read a verse of Scripture, you've seen something you've never seen before? God's Word reminds me of an artichoke. Okay? 
you continue to eat, you continue to peel the leaves, and you eat the bottoms of the leaves until you get to the heart. As you get closer and closer and closer to the heart of the artichoke, the leaves become more tender, more tasty. And yeah, when you get down to the center, you've got the, the purplish leaves with the stickers on top, and you need to watch that you don't get stuck. But when you eat those leaves, they're soft. They're tasty. And then you remove the fuzzy stuff on the artichoke, and you put some salt on it. And it's sweet. And it's tasty. And it's what you were after the whole time, to get through the outer part, to get to the inside. God's word is like that. The deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. The deeper you go, the tastier it is. The deeper you go, the more you see the application. And it's the Holy Spirit that provides the salt that makes it tasty. So now the writer, as we look at verse 7 through 11, the writer quotes Psalms 95, 7 through 11 for the next several verses, which is the second warning in Hebrews to the Jewish people. The first warning was in Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4, against drifting away from the faith. This second warning is against hardening their hearts. Verse 7 quotes from Psalm 95, verse 7, and it means that they are to obey. Today, if you hear his voice. Well, they need to hear his voice. We need to hear his voice. Okay? The Holy Spirit continually speaks. We need to be listening. We need to hear it. Verse 8, interestingly enough, comes from verse 8 in Psalm 95. These verses refer back to the disobedience and faithfulness, faithful sorry, faithlessness of the Jews in the wilderness during the Exodus. And it is spelled out originally in Numbers 13 through 14. God had told in verse, in, sorry, in chapter 13 of Numbers, God had told Moses to select one man from each of the 12 tribes to go spy on the land of Canaan. They went and they returned after 40 days. They came back with differing accounts. They came back with some of the fruit of the land and they came back with differing accounts. Ten of the men said that the land was indeed flowing with milk and honey and the fruit was luscious and flavorful. But then they offered reasons why the people should not go to the land of Canaan, which God had commanded they go to. Caleb, who was one of the twelve, had said, listen, we need to go and take possession of the land because we would prevail. God would be with us. But the warnings of the ten and the reports that the men were of great size. In fact, if you look at, at Numbers 13 and 14, and I encourage you to do that this week, so you know what I'm talking about, talked about the Nephilim. The Nephilim were, re, were originally mentioned in Genesis 6, I believe it was. They were men of great size, they were giants, they were descendants supposedly of the angels and humans. So they were massive. Think of people about the size of Goliath. Shaquille O'Neal type sized people. Huge. Absolutely huge. So the ten looked at the size of the men and said, hey, we shouldn't go there. They're, we're like grasshoppers to them. They are that big. They'll kill us. So if you looked at Numbers 14, the people cried and they complained. And they basically sat there and said, oh, it would have been better if we stayed in Egypt. 
It would have been better if we died there. It would have been better if we died in the wilderness than, than what you're about to do with us now, which is to send us to our death fighting against these massive people. Why is the Lord taking us to this land to die by the sword? Why is the Lord allowing our children and our wives to be taken as bounty, as plunder? Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they wanted to appoint someone to take them back to Egypt. A slam at the leadership of Moses, of Aaron, and of God himself. We read that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and Joshua and Caleb said it was, it was good land. And if the Lord was pleased with them, then God will bring them into the land safely. Just don't rebel against the Lord. And when you read Numbers 14, you see the next thing that happened is the people took up stones and they were about to stone Moses and Aaron and Caleb and Joshua for their audacity to say, we need to follow the Lord and go take that land. And the only thing that saved them was that the glory of the Lord shone over the tent of meeting and the people were afraid. So think about this. Think of, think of the history of the nation of Israel on the exodus from Egypt. Oh, we're tormented. The, the Egyptian slave masters are horrible. We've got to get out of here. God let them out. Now they're on the road, right? They're on their way. And they see Pharaoh approaching with his charioteers and everything else. And it's, oh, we're going to die here. And God causes Moses to do what? What did Moses do with the Red Sea? Yeah. It, the sea parted. And the people walked through on dry land. And they took a stone, one from each, one from each tribe took a stone to the other side and then Moses touched the water again and what happened to the Egyptians? They were consumed by the water. Oh, it would be better if we were back in Egypt. What? It would be better if we were back in Egypt. Oh, we're tired. Oh, we're hungry. We have nothing to eat. Oh, if we had the pots of meat and the leeks. So what did God do when they cried out that they were hungry? Gave them manna, right? He brought manna from heaven for them. David Jeremiah in our study a couple of weeks ago said that when, when manna fell from heaven, they went out and the translation for manna in some translation is, what is it? God brought, what is it, from the sky, but it fed them. And then they got tired of the manna. Oh, we're tired of the manna. So God gave them quail. Oh, we're thirsty. And God brought forth water from a rock. And the people continued to complain. Brothers and sisters, doesn't that describe us sometimes? No matter how God just overflows the cup of blessing, we sit there and look at the one bad thing that's happening in our life at that particular time, instead of all the blessings, right? Verse 9. Verse 9 refers to the continual testing and complaining that the nation of Israel put to God. The continual complaints about the manna, about the quail, about the thirst. They walked for 40 years and God fed them every day. They walked for 40 years and their sandals did not wear out. I wish the tires on my car would last for 40 years, you know? I mean, think about this. 
and they complained anyway. They wandered for 40 years. And if you, again, if you read Numbers 14, the 40 years represented a judgment of one year for every day that the spies spied on, looked at the land of Canaan. They were out there for 40 days checking things out. So the judgment of 40 years was a judgment based upon the 40 days, one year per day. And you look at verse 10. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. Why was God angry with them? They didn't believe. They didn't believe. And what were they doing as a result? They complained. They grumbled. When we grumble against God, we are in sin. It means, God, you're not good enough to deal with what I'm dealing with right now. What you're giving me is not good enough for me. When we think about it in that light, It, it just shows how prideful we are as human beings. So they complained. They complained. They were faithless during the 40 years in the wilderness. But it was even more than that. Their hearts were always going astray. And they did not know God's ways. In spite of his provision and protection, they strayed. In spite of seeing the Red Sea part, they strayed. In spite of being led by God himself in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, they strayed. In spite of God appearing over the tent of meeting, they strayed. In spite, in spite of bringing them to the brink of the promised land, they strayed. And in spite of his promise that they would be his people, and he, the God of the universe, the Lord Sabaoth, would be their God, they strayed. Verse 11. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. But this is really only part of the story. Again, referring back to Numbers 14, if you read it, in verse 12, God was going to destroy the nation of Israel entirely with pestilence, and he was going to dispossess them. Moses interceded with the Lord on their behalf. This man who moments before was about to be stoned to death by his brothers and sisters, along with his brother and two faithful members, Caleb and Joshua. This man of God who had to endure the continual complaints and crying, the questioning, the rebellion, this man pled with God to spare Israel. God was planning to start all over and create the nation of Israel anew through Moses. But Moses resisted that possibility and he begged God to let them live, reminding the Lord of his attributes, of his goodness, of his mercy. God relented. But he promised that all those who were 20 years old or older would never see the promised land. In fact, because they said it would be better if they died in the wilderness, that's exactly what God said would happen. They would die in the wilderness. God would grant their request. Only Caleb and Joshua would be the exception because their hearts were right with God. After the 40-year wandering, only their children would see the promised land. And as for the 10 unbelieving spies 
who said, don't go. The people are too big. God struck them down with a plague before the Lord. In Numbers 14.39, the people mourned greatly. But did they learn? They strayed. In the morning, they woke up. They wanted to go take possession of the land that they were told they could not take possession of now. Moses told them, don't go. You're not going to succeed. But they went anyway. The result, the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the hill country came down, struck them, and beat them down as far as Hormah. Why did they do it? They wanted to fulfill the Lord's original promise. Even though God said no, even though God said, you don't deserve it anymore. You didn't listen to me. You can't, you can't have it. They wanted it anyway. But if you read it further, the reason they failed was that God himself was not with them, and Moses did not go with them. They strayed one final time. The Lord made sure in his judgment that they would not enter the promised land, his rest for them. David had written Psalm 95 to remind Israel in his time to remain faithful to the Lord and to remain steadfast in him. They were to remain obedient, to hear his voice, and resist the urge to dwell apart from the Lord. So why, so why then did the writer of Hebrews choose to include parts of Psalm 95 in the book? And why did I go back to Numbers 13 and 14? Because Numbers 13 and 14 became the basis of Psalm 95, which becomes the basis for what the writer of Hebrews is trying to teach us right now. The Jewish Christians would certainly understand Psalm 95 and more importantly, the basis for it, because Numbers was part of the Pentateuch. They would have studied it, they would have memorized it, so it would serve as a, a continual warning to them to remain faithful to hold fast to the confidence of their faith and to boast in the gospel. It also set the stage for the next verses in chapter 3, which we're going to study next week. So what are we to take from these five verses? I believe there are several truths for us. First, each time we read scripture, we should pray the Holy Spirit will give us understanding and application. We should read it with a confident expectation that the Holy Spirit will show you something new. A quick side note, I've been reading First Chronicles in my quiet time. I had started actually in Joshua and I've moved forward from Joshua through 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and now I'm in 1st Chronicles, and it was no secret why God was leading me in that particular direction at that time. It was because, in many respects, what we at Crossview were going through fell right in line with what I was reading every day. So I'm in the middle of 1st Chronicles. I could go into it every morning not expecting to learn anything new, especially since much, much of what you read in 1 Chronicles was already discussed in 1 Kings. But each day the Lord is showing me principles of godly leadership that I'm supposed to apply in my life, things that I had never seen before, and they're helpful not only with work, but for here at Crossview. I, I started journaling. I just wanted to share a couple of them. Just, and this is from 1 Chronicles 14. Godly leaders seek godly wisdom. 
Do not act without the Lord's leading. First Chronicles 15. Consecrate yourself before serving the Lord. Honor God and show Him respect. Celebrate His presence. 1 Chronicles 16. Worship the Lord with reverence and remember His blessings. Continually worship Him. Each person has a specific task to do before the Lord. 1 Chronicles 17. God's promise, God promises Jesus will come from his line, from David's line. God does the work. We're the blessed recipients. Know that the Lord knows best, and we're to follow him. I could go on. I could spend the rest of the day reading what God gave me over the last months. When I sat down, there was no way that I would have, I would have seen that, except the Holy Spirit showed me. Pray that the Holy Spirit will show you something new. There's always something new there that applies to exactly what you're going through. Expect God to answer and He will. Secondly, when God disciplines us, and we should expect that this is going to happen, or we, end it, or we go through a trial, instead of complaining, we should ask the Lord what He's trying to teach us. Third, if we want to experience God's peace and rest, we need to make sure that we are right with Him. We need to listen. We need to obey when He is speaking to us, and He speaks to us continually. We need to respond immediately, and if things don't quite go the way we want or expect, we should not lose heart or give, ho give up hope. The greatest... All right, one more quick anecdote. I love baseball. I love football, but I love baseball. And sorry, guys, but I am a Yankee fan. I have always been a Yankee fan, and I will be a New York Yankees fan until the day I die. And if God allows baseball in heaven, I'll be a Yankee fan there too. I love the Yankees, always have, always will. And there's nothing anybody can do to change that. The greatest baseball hitters in the world fail seven times for every ten times they get up to bat. They fail seven times. And they're great. They make $150 million over four years, failing seven times out of ten. If you went to work and failed seven times out of ten, do you think you'll get $150 million? You'd be lucky to get $150 before we get let go, right? But the point is that they go up every time expecting to get a hit. Every time they go up, it doesn't matter who they're facing. Our oldest Chapman throwing at 104 miles an hour, it doesn't matter. They're going up, they're going to get a hit. They're going, to get, going up against R.A. Dickey and his knuckleball, it doesn't matter. They're going up, they're going to get a hit. If you go up expecting you're going to get a hit, you're going to get a hit. You won't hit a home run if you sit in the dugout and pout instead of standing in a batter's box swinging. Great hitters make adjustments. They work on their weaknesses. Ask God to show you this week your weakness and know his ways and he's going to answer.